Mm-hmm. All right, all right, all right. Hi, my name is Ernest Young, and today I'm talking to you about the physics of Interstellar. Now, if you haven't watched the movie yet, I strongly encourage you to do so because it has our most scientifically accurate depictions of a black hole. And they got a lot of the physics right, including the gravitational lensing effect in general relativity, where light from stars and galaxies behind the black hole come at us, gets bent coming around the black hole, focuses back into the camera to form the image we see. So I strongly encourage you to watch it uh, because it derives the images of the black hole and the, even the wormhole sequences directly from Einstein's field equations. But what I want to talk to you about today is a part of the movie that bothers people, that raises the most questions, to have people saying, no way, but I'm here to say there is a way. And so, spoiler alert, it's the part after Cooper played by Matthew McConaughey, falls into the black hole and enters the Tesseract. Now, there are two cornerstones of modern physics I need to introduce to you, the first being Einstein's general relativity. And so the top equation is Einstein's field equation, which tells us that mass energy on the right-hand side of that equation curves space-time on the left, and that curvature is given by the Ricci curvature tensor and Ricci scalar. The bottom equation is the Einstein, what's called the Einstein-Hilbert action, and physicists use it to calculate geodesics, fake paths of least distance, least time, and curved space, how stars, planets, rockets will travel freely in curved space-time. Uh, and a form of this equation was used in a movie on the chalkboard of Professor Brand in the movie. One concept I want to introduce to you during our short visit of general relativity is a metric. So think of it like a ruler, measuring distances in space and time. Now usually this ruler doesn't change in time and space, so we say space-time is flat, its curvature is zero. For a black hole, that changes. The metric depends on how close you are to the black hole, and so space-time gets more and more curved as you approach the center of this black hole. So in this particular, the curvature is not zero, but positive, since the black hole is spherically symmetric. The second cornerstone of modern physics I want to introduce to you is quantum field theory. And I want to show you this huge equation called the Lagrangian of the standard model in quantum field theory because this equation tells us all the dynamics of the fundamental forces in nature, except for gravity, uh, how it works, uh, the strong, the weak, the electromagnetic forces, tells us everything that comes out of the Large Hadronic Collider, how stars, planets, atoms, matter, us are kept together. One idea I want to introduce to you out of quantum field theory is symmetry. So what does it mean for something to be symmetrical? If you take a vase and rotate it around, it doesn't change shape because it's symmetrical. If I take my right hand and look at it in the mirror, it now looks like my left hand. So it's not symmetrical under mirror transformations. So Physicists can abstract this and say, you know, if something does something um, and it doesn't change, then it's symmetrical under that transformation. Uh, so physicists found that for that huge Lagrangian, that huge equation I showed you, if you plug in uh, these changes, and I'll focus on the delta G, delta W, delta B in the middle, uh, plug those changes into the respective fields, those terms that I showed you in that equation, then the terms add and cancel each other out such that the Lagrangian doesn't change. And so physicists call these symmetries. And what ends up happening is for each of these symmetries, we associate a particle for the strong, weak electromagnetic forces uh, to exchange force. One more ingredient I need to introduce to you is the relationship between information, entropy, and black holes. So what is information? What's data? What makes a signal? We can define what's useful data against what's noise and quantify how likely the probability, the chance of getting useful information that's not noise with what's called the Shannon entropy. This Shannon entropy uh, is formally equal to the entropy in classical and quantum physics. And remind you, entropy is like this measure of disorder. Like, your clean room has a lower entropy than a messy room that could be messy in many ways. So think, entropy is information. Now, what does that have to do with black holes? Stephen Hawking, 
and Jacob Birkenstein had calculated the entropy of a black hole to be proportional to its surface area. It's surface area A and not its volume. So it says if the entropy or information about the black hole, its mass, its electric charge, angular momentum, spin, was encoded on its two-dimensional surface. So that this three-dimensional black hole is a like hologram uh, of its surface. So physicists have extended this idea to say that a description of a bulk of space is encoded on the boundary of the bulk, hence the holographic principle. I'm just going to call it its technical term, which is ADS-CFT correspondence. So one candidate for a five-dimensional bulk, or like the shape of our five-dimensional universe I want to propose, is called ADS or anti de Sitter space. So it's a solution to that Einstein's field equation, so it's legit. It has negative curvature, so it's like inside out. Uh, and I think its surface is on, hence on the inside. An example, so this, so we have a holographic duality or this ADS CFT correspondence between quantum field theory on the left hand side, this huge equation I showed before, uh, living on a four dimensional space time boundary surface of this bigger five dimensional anti de Sitter space that's represented on the right. So if there's any high level concept I just want you to take away from this is that quantum field theory represented by that huge equation tells us, you know, how all matter is put together, how, how we're put together with strong, weak electromagnetic forces. And so we're living on the surface of a greater five-dimensional ADS space with negative curvature. So I'm watching this movie, Interstellar, for the first time, and Cooper and the team go through the wormhole the first time. Uh, and the scientist tells Cooper they're passing through a bulk, and I thought, no way they're talking about the same bulk that I studied in graduate school about ADS-CFT correspondence because it's, a, it's actually a technical term that we physicists use. Then after uh, Cooper and Brand land on the first planet, they talk about communicating through uh, the five-dimensional bulk, and I thought no way they were talking about ADS-5 space and relating it to entropy and information and sending signals and messages. But when I first saw the scene of Cooper in the Tesseract, and I just thought, my God, this is our best description of an ADS-CFT correspondence. Because the Tesseract is a four-dimensional in space hypercube with three-dimensional cubes in space as faces. And Cooper is inside those three-dimensional spatial cubes because, you know, he's a three-dimensional being. The laws of quantum field theory still have to behave. So he's allowed to exist there while he's, you know, through this boundary, able to interact through this five-dimensional bowl. Now, I would classify, so he's in the Tesseract, and I would classify the two types of messaging he is doing in the Tesseract uh, as thus. So first, Cooper was able to hit on the bookshelves and exert a force, and young Murph was able to see these falling books. The second type is with the watch, where Cooper was able to push on the Tesseract to move the second hand. So here's the fun part. For the first type, Cooper is, I would say, exerting a gravitational force across his five-dimensional space-time of ADS-5 uh, space. Now, we know Einstein's field equations allow for gravity waves to propagate, and they're able to propagate at shorter distances because of the negative curvature of ADS-5 space. Now, the only problem I have with it is, remember, I was talking about symmetry in quantum theor field theory and how we got to associate a particle to, it, to that. So, to a force, and the f particle I would associate with gravity is a graviton, possibly a massless spin-2 boson, and while it's massless, it's no light geodesic, its trajectory through this five-dimensional ADS-5 space might not make it backwards in time to Murph. However, the Stephen Hawking, the wheelchair physicist, and Jacob Birkenstein while they were calculating the upper bound of that black hole entropy, and I showed that as S equals uh, A divided by, I think, 4 pi, um, 
along the way, they were trying to resolve a paradox with black holes, which is, in simple terms, if you took useful data like a computer from our universe and threw it into a black hole, because we can't observe it ev anymore, that data becomes inaccessible to us. So, you know, we, we effectively increase the entropy of our universe, and if we kept on throwing useful data into a black hole, we just, you know, blast the entropy of the universe we live in and can observe, you know, to infinity. But what's found is that uh, there's a consensus among physicists that information is conserved. So that information um, would get radiated back out through, you know, some mechanism like Hawking radiation. So when Cooper and TARS fell into that black hole, what should have happened was that they get ripped apart by the tidal gravitational forces uh, and their useful information, their knowledge about, you know, both the quantum data and how Cooper wants to re reunite with Murph uh, gets radiated out by Hawking radiation. But because they were saved by the Tesseract, somehow that information had to get out. So in order to conserve information, their information from the future had to go back into uh, information, useful information to Murph in the past. And I'm smiling uh, ear to ear right now. The second type of messaging uh, I, I, I could appreciate because I would associate that with what's called an EPR pair. Uh, entangled um, pair of uh, quantum states. So that will resolve the fact that, you know, you're watching this movie and he's able to instantaneously send uh, information across galaxies and simultane seemingly simultaneously to uh, an adult birth uh, through this entangled pair. Uh, and then I would be remiss if I didn't mention the latest findings in theoretical physics that ER equals EPR which uh, says that for each, uh, you know, entangled qu quantum states, how they're messaging each other could be, you know, these mini wormholes that allow for these messages to pass. All right, so I came out of watching this movie uh, for the first time in 2014 with two realizations. Number one, I've mentioned before that, you know, uh, this is one of our greatest cinematic depictions of an ADS CFT correspondence. Uh, this was, you know, a summary of everything I was like studying for in graduate school for my master's, and I cried. The second realization I had was that, you know, if if we did, if I stayed in academia and, or you know, if our peers continue to just publish papers, uh, uh, you know come up with more elaborate mathematical theories, testing this or seeing this phenomenon, the probability of that is zero. Because what I believe is that the technology of society has not caught up with the questions that high energy particle theoretical physics was now posing. And in order to, you know, go out and explore and make the unknown known and, you know, have these experiments and these observations, the answers weren't lying in more books, more lectures, more papers, more theory, but in aiding the engineering effort for space launch. And so my dream changed. It, it changed from, you know, wanting to be an academic, and I wanted to be a professor for a long time, you know, since I was in high school of physics. It changed to, you know, somehow wanting to contribute to the engineering effort in space launch. And if it will at least make the probability of seeing these things go from zero to uh, some positive value. Maybe not in my generation or in generations come, even in a movie, it might be another space-faring civilization that be able to do it, then I think that would be just fantastic. And so I gave it the PhD program. Um, I left a lot of wonderful friends that I still miss in Central Europe, in Czech Republic, in Italy, that I miss dearly to this day. Uh, there was a number of wonderful relationships for whatever complicated reasons, analogous to how Cooper had to leave Young Murph that I couldn't 
make work alongside work. But I came back to LA, you know, and I applied for jobs in engineering and space launch. And, you know, after the first rejection, I'd try again or learn something new and then apply again. And then weeks turned in months of rejection. And then months became year after year applying, being rejected and being unemployed and feeling like I couldn't catch a break to work towards my dreams of being in space launch. But each time I failed, you know, I learned something new and um, just applied myself and just taught myself something new in programming. Um, I, I drove for Uber, but not specifically to make money, but I drove around near, you know, the companies that I wanted to apply for and drop up my resume. I went to um, data science meetups in San Francisco just to try to network and try to bring tech and space launch together. And so, you know, it was through not giving up on this new dream that I had that when Virgin Orbit called, you know, I was so prepared because I made all the mistakes in the book that, you know, uh, that became my first job. And it was, I'm proud to say that last year we were the third commercial company to go, go into orbit and launch and put a satellite into space. Um, and so I wanted to thank you for this opportunity to let me speak and reflect uh, because it's allowed me an opportunity to look and see what other dreams lay ahead, just like you know anyone's waking dream at Burning Man. So whatever your dreams are, maybe it's space travel, maybe it's to make more money, or maybe it's just to catch vibes all the time. Maybe it's that guy or girl you think is out of your league, but you dream they'd be in your life. Whatever it is, dream big. Because our greatest accomplishments, our greatest moments in life cannot be behind us, but our destiny lies above us.